It has been a day of startling images out of the city of Khartoum in Sudan. Fighter jets roaring overhead, the sound of artillery, gunfire and explosions all around as a civil war rages through the streets. We are also uh, afraid of running short of our food supplies here in Kobe because all markets are, uh, uh, are closed. Raggy has the story for us tonight and will explain why and how it has come to this as hundreds of thousands are imprisoned in their homes. Also on News at 10. The price of criticising Putin, a joint British-Russian citizen, is sentenced to 25 years in prison. 200,000 appointments missed due to the recent strikes in the health service, but patients tell us why they still back the doctor's and nurse's decision. The case that could cost Rupert Murdoch almost $2 billion, and which many see as critical to the functioning of US democracy and... The glorious seagrass meadow off Cornwall and why its discovery is good news for the environment. It's a habitat which has the ability to capture and store carbon, which at a time of a climate crisis is invaluable. This is ITV News at 10 with Tom Bradby. Good evening. The lethal rattle of gunfire and the blasts of explosions are intensifying in Sudan tonight as the battle for political supremacy there is played out with ever-increasing violence on the streets of its cities. Two big rivals, the country's army and a powerful paramilitary force, are fighting it out for control of the country. All calls for a ceasefire have so far gone unheeded. In the capital Khartoum and other big cities, thousands of people are trapped in their homes by the deadly crossfire, too terrified to venture out. At least 180 civilians have been killed as the battle rages in the densely populated urban areas. But with bodies said to be lying unclaimed in streets too dangerous to reach, the number of dead could be much higher. Sudan's capital, Khartoum, on the banks of the mighty Nile River, today in flames and smoke. For three days now, from early morning, the city has been abuzz with what sounded like an air and ground assault. Hard to imagine that only two years ago, Sudan looked beyond its borders, even dreaming of making peace with Israel. Today, this Muslim Arab nation is at war with itself. Naba is a journalist in Khartoum. The last two days and nights were literally a nightmare for me and for everyone I know, uh, especially that I live very close to pres the presidential palace and the military headquarters. So we were hearing explosions, bombings. We were seeing aircrafts for the first time in our lives. A former British historical territory, Sudan today is split between a faction loyal to the civilian government and a faction loyal to paramilitary forces. They've been fighting for key possessions like the capital's airport and the key Red Sea port of Port Sudan. Naba says the resulting fighting has trapped civilians like her in a humanitarian no man's land. We were not able to go out, not able to get any supplies, food or water. We were using what we have. Sudan is just one of 54 African countries, yet this one country alone is bigger than all of Western Europe put together. Yet tonight its capital is going without the most basic needs. It's the second day here in Khartoum and we do not have uh, uh, water here in Khartoum. We are also uh, afraid of running short of our food supplies here in Kobe because all markets are, uh, uh, are closed. Today, the UN Secretary General sounded the international alarm. I strongly condemn the outbreak of fighting that is taking place in Sudan and appeal to the leaders of the Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support forces to immediately cease hostilities, restore calm, and begin a dialogue to resolve the crisis. 
As Sudan's capital has burnt for three days, a measure of how deep the conflict could run comes in a report just as we came on air that says the EU ambassador there has been assaulted in his diplomatic compound. Well, the violent rivalry tearing Sudan apart has its roots in the country's troubled recent history. The long-simmering dispute between the army and a rival paramilitary group is the latest in a series of power struggles in Sudan. The rival leaders are General Abdel Fattah al bahan head of the SAF, Sudan's armed forces, and General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, leader of the RSF, the so-called Rapid Support Forces. They were allies and worked together to topple former president Omar al-Bashir in 2019. Another coup followed two years later, ousting Prime Minister Abdul Hamdok. And the two generals seized control once again, but now disagree on the country's future and civilian rule. Uh, and Raghi is here uh, to tell us all about it. Look, Sudan is not high up the news agenda here, probably as often um, as it should be. So can you explain what's going on here and how you think it'll end? Well, this is, I think, a struggle for one of the biggest countries in the whole of the African continent. Uh, as I said in my piece, Sudan alone, if you could put all 27 countries in the EU into one country, that would fit into Sudan. Mm -hmm. And that is only one of 54 African countries. It straddles an incredibly geostrategically important part of the world, looking over the Red Sea and also the Horn of Africa. So um, uh, there's been a transition into democracy struggling into sort of Sudan for the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. But um, um, it's been a sort of orphan of neglect, if I put it that way, because of the troubles in Ukraine, the West's leverage, and particularly Britain's, which is a former, Sudan is a former British uh, territory, um, has suffered in terms of the intervention by Western countries mm -hmm. into there. So what you have is a power struggle between a civilian-led government broadly mm -hmm. and the armed forces that are supported by regional powers. And um, I hate to say it, but I just don't see much hope for it because of its neglect, because it's in the wrong part of the world where the Western, you know, democratic nations are not looking hard on. Raghi, I hope that's wrong, but let's see. Thank you very much indeed. Now, from one war to another, uh, and the long prison sentence handed down today to a prominent critic of Russia's invasion of Ukraine provided stark confirmation that dissent on this issue will be silenced, whoever you are. The fact that Vladimir Karamurza holds British as well as Russian citizenship didn't stop him being sent to jail for 25 years by a court in Moscow. And that's not to mention claims that he's already survived two attempts to poison him. Britain has demanded his release, with the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, paying pointed tribute to his courage. As the judge announced a jail sentence of 25 years, Vladimir Karamurza simply raised an eyebrow and smiled. His defiance of the Kremlin continues. This regime that is in power in our country today, it's not just corrupt, it's not just kleptocratic, it's not just authoritarian. It is a regime of murderers. He was arrested soon after giving that interview, but it was just one of many. Fellow activist Vladimir Karamurza, who claims he survived two attempts to poison him. He was a fearless and frequent critic of Vladimir Putin, but was charged with treason after making this speech in America, just three weeks after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. These are very dark times in Russia today. These are times when we have hundreds of political prisoners, so that number is only going to grow now as, as people are arrested for taking part in anti-war demonstrations. He became the latest political prisoner when he returned home. He was ready to sacrifice everything for his country, for his beliefs and for his ideas. And, and that's something that nobody in the West can imagine because we don't have those types of people in the West. He studied and worked in the UK for many years and had British citizenship. The Foreign Office summoned the Russian ambassador to protest at his punishment. The British ambassador attended the court hearing in Moscow and said the UK government was calling for Mr Karamurza's immediate release. The US joined the chorus of outrage. Criminalization of criticism of government action is a sign of weakness, not strength. As the media watched a feed of court proceedings, they were in turn being monitored. The crackdown on dissent has intensified in Putin's Russia even before the invasion of Ukraine. And yet at his trial, Mr Karamurza said he was proud of speaking out. Ian Woods, News at 10.
A police officer has been charged with three counts of rape whilst on duty in Plymouth. Sergeant David Stansbury of Devon and Cornwall Police will appear before magistrates in Plymouth on Wednesday. The alleged attacks, said to have taken place in 2009, have been under investigation since they were reported in September 2020. Mr Stansbury, who now serves with Hertfordshire Police, has been suspended from duty. During the recent junior doctor strike, we heard accounts from patients who had appointments cancelled. We even saw for ourselves the eerily empty hospital spaces where postponed procedures should have ta been taking place. Well, today, NHS England revealed that waiting lists have been swollen by nearly 200,000 appointments missed during the strike. But with the prospect now of more nurses' strikes too, some affected patients are telling us they still back their action. For Jamie Hale, the confirmation of more NHS strikes has a very direct impact. He's already had one operation cancelled. He's on the waiting list for a larger one. Despite that... I fully support the strikes and, yes, I've had a procedure cancelled and because that procedure has been cancelled, I'm in increasing discomfort. But at the same time, I feel like without being able to pay doctors and nurses fairly, we won't have an NHS to treat people in the future. During the most recent four-day strike by junior doctors, 195,000 operations were cancelled, the greatest number so far. Over the last five months, nearly half a million NHS appointments have been rescheduled. Now the Royal College of Nurses has rejected the latest pay offer, they will strike again between April the 30th and May the 2nd and haven't ruled out coordinating their strikes with junior doctors in the future. As time goes on, and should we be striking to Christmas if there is a further mandate for strike from our nursing staff? Of course there will be an impact with doctors and nurses both being on strike, but this is in the hands of the government now to sort out. And I would suggest we need to do that very, very quickly. Let's get round the table and add more money to the table and get these strikes stopped. NHS leaders say coordinated action would cause unprecedented difficulties. That would be uncharted territory for the NHS. We've never experienced that and that would require an enormous amount of planning and preparation. And, and I know that trust leaders would be dreading that scenario. The Prime Minister. It's not only the NHS the Prime Minister is still battling with. Teachers in England and Northern Ireland are also due to walk out again in April and May. Announcing a plan for more maths in schools today, Rishi Sunak insisted the government's been reasonable on strikes. Isn't the most pressing maths problem at the moment what formula you are going to come up with for ending them? And do you acknowledge there is going to have to be more money put on the table? Well, there has been more money put on the table, significant more money. And in fact, that was recognised by the, the unions, in particular by the leadership of the nurses' union, the RCN, at the time that we announced the agreement. We remain committed to finding a way through these things. He might be committed, but every new strike day increases the impact on children's education and the nation's health. And for a prime minister just a few weeks away from local elections, that is a significant problem. Romilly Weeks, News at 10. There was a nasty surprise waiting for Rishi Sunak as MPs began to trickle back to work after their Easter break today. It's emerged that the Parliamentary Standards Watchdog has opened an investigation into the Prime Minister under its Commons Code of Conduct. It's looking into allegations that he might have failed to declare shares held by his wife in a childcare company. And she had, joins me now. Um, Downing Street seems more than usually adamant that this is a procedural matter rather than them attempting to conceal something. What do you make of it? Yeah, they, they are very confident that the Prime Minister's not done anything wrong. The, the, the line, an investigation has been launched into the Prime Minister, never sounds good. But you're right, Number 10 are incredibly confident. This, as you say, relates to whether or not the Prime Minister declared an interest properly or whether he failed to declare it. It's about his wife. It's about shareholdings in a childcare company. Mm -hmm. The reason why that's so important is because childcare policy was a flagship part of the recent government budget. This came up. Uh, the last time the Prime Minister faced a committee of MPs last month. Here's what he had to say at the time. Do you think the Prime said, Minister wishes to declare in respect of that? No, I mean, all my, all my disclosures are declared in the, in, the normal, in the normal way. 
Now, the Prime Minister didn't mention it then. The mm. MP's code of conduct expects MPs to be open and frank about mm. all their declarations. That committee hearing was then followed up by the Prime Minister writing to the chair of the committee to say that he had gone through the Cabinet office about this declaration and that a list of ministerial interests would be updated or published soon. That's not been updated for the last one year. When it is updated, this may be on there. Ultimately, it's up to the independent advisor to decide what goes on that list and whether it's in the public interest for that to happen. Number 10 say they are and they will assist with the investigation anyway to clarify that this has all been transparently declared. Ultimately, it is up to the commissioner to decide whether that's accurate or not. OK, uh, to be continued. But for now, thank you very much. Now, on one level, it is a court case with an eye-popping amount at stake and a cast of characters that might stretch the plot line of even the TV show Succession. Though the two are easily confused, to be fair. Rupert Murdoch and Fox News are being sued for more than a billion and a half dollars for allegedly repeating, endlessly, claims that the last presidential election was rigged by a particular voting systems company. But to win a case like this in the US, you need to show not just that someone said something about you that wasn't true, but that they knew it was a lie when they said it. That is why this case is so consequential, not just for Fox and Murdoch, but for the very concept of what the media is and what it should be. Some are calling it the fake news trial. This understated courthouse in Delaware is about to host the media trial of the century, an attempt to hold Fox News accountable for its role in promoting false narratives and misinformation death. about the that 2020 election. Big... My friend Donald J. Trump. It puts Rupert Murdoch at the heart of the ferocious debate about that election, which is still being fought over not just in the courtroom, but across America's great political divide. Our role is to take three steps back and discern what really matters. Fox News promotes itself as a straight-shooting news channel, fiercely defending the right to question the establishment. Fox is the one place where dissent is allowed. We have voices. We won't be silent. Who controls my voice? Nobody. At the heart of the court case, which is expected to start tomorrow, is the view of conspiracy theorists that Dominion's voting machines, which are used in more than half of U.S. states, were manipulated, and therefore that the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump. Fox gave ample airtime to those extreme views. Those Dominion software systems, they changed more votes than Vladimir Putin ever did. We talked about the Dominion software. I know that there were voting irregularities. Tell me about that. They were flipping votes in the computer system or adding votes that did not exist. There really has been an assault on truth, and there's been an assault on the press as truth tellers, and Trump has certainly been a perpetuator of that assault. And quite ironically, some of the hosts on Fox News have been perpetuators of that assault, too. And so some would say that there's some hypocrisy now in Fox News wrapping itself in the First Amendment and saying we're journalists, we need to be protected for providing this newsworthy information to the public. So there really is a reckoning around this issue now. Dominion's defamation lawsuit is demanding $1.6 billion in damages. It's also being watched as a test case in an era of misinformation and whether media companies can be held responsible. Central to Fox News' defense is the First Amendment and freedom of expression. Their executives arguing that if Dominion wins, it would be a grave threat to journalism. But more liberal voices insist that actually, this is a right-wing channel that cannot hide behind the Constitution, given its role in the big lie of 2020. Robert Moore, News at 10, Washington. Well, still with the US, a new plan has been launched in America to try to contain the horrific toll taken by its opioid epidemic. A life-saving drug to counteract overdoses is to be made more widely available. It is expensive, but just consider the alternative. Last year, an average of 290 people a day died from the effects of these powerfully addictive painkillers. Yes, you heard me right, 290 a day. What did he take? It is the critical weapon. I'm going to get him with Narcan, OK? In the war against America's opioid drug epidemic. This paramedic is unwrapping a nasal spray called Narcan. All right, can you help me set this up, please? 
it has almost miraculous properties to bring back overdose victims from the brink of death. We do? Okay. Now this vital treatment is being made available over the counter. Can you sit up for me, sweetie? As the United States seeks to battle the devastating toll of fentanyl. He's, he's awake, he's sitting he's awake, up. Yeah. A synthetic okay. drug many times stronger than heroin. In a car park in central Washington, D.C., almost within sight of Capitol Hill, we find fentanyl addicts who know how Narcan can be vital. It saved my life, but I've saved a lot of lives with Narcan. Like many here, Sandy is a fentanyl addict involved in a daily struggle to fund her habit. I get a bag, a dime bag, and I can stretch it throughout the day. How much does that cost? It's $10. But I was spending about $500 a day on, on it. But I had to get myself down to it because I was doing so much of it. It was, it was ridiculous. How were you affording that $500 a day? Prostitution. Really? Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you think you can beat it? No. Monique is homeless and addicted to fentanyl. She has first-hand experience of being saved by Narcan. I um, did some fentanyl and went out over there in the alley and they gave me the Narcan and it, it, it brought me back. That little sliver right there, uh, Narcan saves. Across the car park is Dr. Edwin Chapman's medical practice. He highlights statistics showing how Narcan has helped, but warns cost will be critical. It's going to make it better for people who have money. Uh, you shouldn't have to pay for it because that's going to be a barrier, especially for the population that's most impacted. But it's not just the inner city poor who need Narcan. Josh Symes was well-educated, middle class and addicted to fentanyl. He was saved twice by the nasal spray before finally overdosing, leaving behind a devastated family. Something I never thought I would have to do at 31. I didn't think I would have to lose a partner. That's something that you don't ever prepare for. Um, fentanyl might be the worst thing <laughs> in the world. Uh, Josh's mother had a few more precious months with her son, thanks to Narcan. It was a lifesaver for Josh several times. We had him longer because of it, and I'm eternally grateful for that. Josh died on his 31st birthday one of 1,500 opioid victims in the United States each week. No, no, no. Hey, hey, hey. hey. It's a toll to which wider access to Narcan might help to reverse. Dan Rivers, News at 10, Washington. An utterly debilitating and depressing story that is just rolling on and on and on. Now, back here, there are fears that more horse races could be disrupted after Saturday's controversial Grand National when the start was delayed by animal rights protesters. One horse died following a fall at the first fence after the race eventually did get underway. Its trainer claims the horse had been unsettled by the disruption prior to the event. The animal welfare charity, the RSPCA, today called for reforms to the historic race. The horse on the left is Hill 16, jockey Ryan Mania an experienced runner with a former Grand National winner in the saddle. But at Aintree on Saturday, they fell at the first fence. The horse was so badly injured it had to be put down. Today, the man who trained Hill 16 returned for the first time to its old stables. It's obviously a very, very sombre place today. It'll never replace, you know, a lovely, lovely horse. Saturday's Grand National was disrupted by a high-profile protest, a group called Animal Rising, managed to break in past security and delayed the start. The animals were kept in a holding area. Everything being done to keep him as calm as possible. Hill 16 is seen here in front of a horse that lost its rider. Such was the chaos of the delay. Well, I'm absolutely furious about what they've done because they've used an event um, to further their cause um, and they've had no thought of the welfare of the horses. The protesters would say that they were there because horse racing regularly has horses die. That, 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 that is true. Um, we, we can't get away from that. In the last nine years, there have been an average of, of one or two um, fallers at the first and second fence. And, and this year there was eight. 
So, you know, the statistics show that, that, that yeah, something was very different and, and that was the difference. Animal rights groups want horse racing banned and have pledged to continue disruption. Claudio Rojas was there on Saturday. I do believe that these people who work with these horses love them and, and care for them. But unfortunately, they are then still put in situations where they are in harm's way, where they are going to potentially break limbs, break their necks, be shot, where they are whipped. Already this year, 50 horses have been killed in accidents on UK racetracks. At Aintree alone, the home of the Grand National, there have been 64 horse deaths in the past 20 years. And Hill 16 was just one of three fatalities there on Saturday. There is inherent risk in every sport, but it's particularly the case in horse racing when you look at the speed and strength of these animals and what they're being asked to do. The question for horse racing is how much risk is too much and what are they going to do to mitigate it? Over the last 20 years, we've changed a huge amount consistently to make the race as safe as it can be. And, you know, we're flexible to doing that in future, but it is always done um, on a data-led making sure that we're not making any knee-jerk reactions. Today, trainer Sandy Johnson returned to racing with a royal welcome, and the jockey that fell with Hill 16 returned to the saddle. This sport goes on, but it is braced for further disruption with the Scottish Grand National this Saturday. Peter Smith, News at 10, Kelso. And protests disrupted the World Snooker Championship at the Sheffield Crucible tonight. Two Just Stop Oil protesters invaded the arena just as the evening's session of first round matches was getting underway. One of them managed to empty a bag of orange powder onto one of the tables. Play was suspended for cleaning after the protesters were led away. Why, you might ask, stop oil and snooker? A tricky one. We understand the thinking seems to have been that we will be snookered by new oil and gas. I mean, yes, really. It's about a pun. It is one of Wales's most famous and beautiful national parks, and now the Brecon Beacons will be known by its old Welsh name. Park administrators say the time is right for the change and called upon the services of Welsh acting royalty to explain why. Banai Brecheiniog, an old name for a new way to be, a name from our past to take us into our future. The change is designed to promote the area's culture and heritage. Now, we're often reporting on the ongoing toll taken on our planet by climate change, so it's good to be able to bring some positive environmental news from as close to home as the seabed of Cornwall. Scientists have discovered a huge seagrass meadow, important not just for its rich diversity of marine life, but also because it's great at capturing carbon. Seagrass meadows are safe havens for hundreds of different marine species. But over the years, these sensitive sites have been disappearing right around our coastline due to dredging, development and pollution. That's what makes the discovery in Sintostal Bay of over 350 hectares of it significant. So were you surprised to find this amount of seagrass? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we didn't, we knew we had substantial seagrass beds here, but every day we found more and more. And that was extraordinary and something that was just such a cause for celebration. Conservationists surveyed and mapped St. Hostel Bay's seabed using echo sounders on boats and by diving under these waters. A bed that size provides lots and lots of benefits to us as people as well as wildlife. You know, yes, it does support extraordinary biodiversity. Hundreds of different species of plants and animals will live in that seagrass bed, including the well-known and beautiful seahorse. And of course, it's in a really valuable blue carbon habitat. It's a habitat which has the ability to capture and store carbon, which at a time of a climate crisis is invaluable and a natural solution that we really do need to focus on. Despite its importance, though, seagrass is still under threat. Cornwall Wildlife Trust believe we can all play a part in protecting it by leaving it and the creatures that call it home undisturbed so it can both survive and thrive. Grace Pascoe, News at 10, St Hostel Bay. Finally, in years to come, what might be your treasured memory of next month's coronation? The pomp, the solemnity, the crowds, the music, or perhaps... A piece of quiche. Charles and Camilla today chose their special recipe for the big coronation lunches. Coronation quiche, an open flan made of eggs and cheese with plenty of spinach. 
like its predecessor, Coronation Tricking. It's aiming to be the staple of buffets up and down the country. Don't say we didn't warn you. Coronation Quiche, now I've seen it all. That's it for tonight, see you tomorrow. Good night, thanks for watching.